technical issues. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Nicole Ammon. I am a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and manager of Integrated Healthcare Initiatives. Um, I'm part of the ECHO team and helping out uh, the, the GROW ECHO today with facilitation. Um, normally this role would be filled by Margie Sanders and uh, is Margie with us today? Margie, there you are. Can you unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Hi everyone, and thank you, Nicole. Um, I really appreciate all the work that everyone's done. Um, I was one of those people because of illness was unable to uh, to do much with this um, presentation this time. But uh, I'm Margie Sanders. I am assistant professor in family and community medicine at Neomed, and I am the PD of the um, geriatric workforce enhancement program at Neomed. So, and welcome. Thank you all for being here. Glad to see you, Margie. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. I am. So I believe that Sue Hazlitt is not with us today, but she's another. I'm here. But you are here? Hi. I'm here. Excellent. So I'm another one who um, was dealing with some illness, though, so, but I'm, I'm back. So my name's Sue Hazlitt. I am a RN at Suma Health, and I'm the project manager for the Neomed Web. Good to see you today too. Um, let's go to Jen Drost. Hi, um, I'm Jen Drost. I am a geriatrician uh, with Suma Health and I'm the um, co-director for the GWEP team. Awesome, thanks. Brandy, and I'm not gonna try your last name because I, there was too many consonants next to each other for me. Oh, why not? Um, <laughs> Brandy Krizanowski, I have it shortened on my title because it's way too long, um, but I work for Direction Home Area Agency on Aging, and I am uh, the social work partner here on this grant. Awesome, welcome. And Denise. Hi, I'm Denise Kropp. I am the data manager for the GWEP grant as well as the ECHO coordinator for our GROW ECHO. So today's Grow Echo does have continuing education credits with it. Um, the EADS code, if you go to EADS.com or use the app, which I use the app, I find it much easier, um, is 05DHOW, and that will be put into the chat box so that you can all go there and collect your continuing education credits. And we have a, the didactic presentation today is by Bonnie Berman and Marty Willeman. So, Bonnie and Marty, do you want to unmute and introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Marty Willeman. Um, I am the program director for Ohio Council for Cognitive Health and very pleased to be able to uh, help with the didactic um, today for this uh, important uh, presentation. I'm a nurse by background um, and uh, worked in the dementia care field for um, 20 plus years. I uh, have a background in hospital care, um, home health care, health education, and uh, in, in the last 20 years, dementia care. Thank you. Hi everyone, I am Bonnie Berman. I am also with the Ohio Council for Cognitive Health, and uh, it is an absolute joy for both Marty and myself to be here and be part of this uh, GWEP. Uh, my background has been both in public policy and academia, and most importantly, my goal is to help folks uh, change the culture both of aging and the way we see dementia. Excellent. So will one of you be uh, sharing your screen for the didactic? Yes. Do you want to start that now? Yeah, you can go ahead and start. Okay. So we'll do that and then we'll take a couple questions afterwards before we get to the case. Okay, are we all set? Okay. Well, we're gonna, 
Everyone knows, of course, why we are here. Um, and for our part of the presentation, we have five key objectives. As you can see, the first two focus broadly on dementia so that everybody is on the same page. And then the last part of our presentation really focuses on the topic at hand, and that is the specific opportunities um, and challenges of working with folks impacted by dementia during uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. As, as we said, Marty and I represent um, and are with the Ohio Council for Cognitive Health, and we are active partners in the GWEP grant. And as you can see, our focus is to work with individuals and full communities who are living to ensure that individuals and family members are able to continue to live the most purposeful life in their community of choice. We see dementia differently, as you will see throughout this presentation, and our goal is to ensure that we that everyone that is impacted by dementia, including the individual who has the dementia, is included in everything that we do. As you'll see from this slide, uh, we're pretty focused uh, kind of people. And we have four core values and we, we ensure that everything we do is uh, driven by these core values. Most specifically and important for this presentation is that we are involved in four federal grants uh, here in Ohio. And we are the, we do hold the state license for the Dementia Friends program. And so with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Marty, who is going to begin by getting us all on the same page of how we see dementia. Thanks, Bonnie. And I am going to go through these slides rather quickly because we want to leave ample time for the case study and uh, responses to the case study. So as Bonnie said, just to get everybody on the same page, we want to define dementia. It's not just, it's not a specific disease, but as that overall umbrella term that describes changes in memory, a specifically short-term memory, when we're talking about um, early uh, stage dementia, changes in language, problem and decision-making skills. And th the real issue here is that those changes are at the level where they're impacting the person's ability to get through their day. Because we all have lapses in our memory, right? And we all um, make bad decisions once in a while, but the, the key issue here is that the frequency is enough where it's impacting that person's ADLs. So there are many types of dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common type, making up about 60 to 80 percent of all dementia. And you see some of the other types of dementia listed here. We certainly don't have time to go into all of those, but um, uh, just know that the reference sheets that I will include with the slides um, will direct you to more information about these different types of dementia. Now, when you think about um, COVID-19 and its impact on older adults and those with underlying medical conditions, and you look at the asterisk of, you know, 80% of people that have dementia are, are over the age of 75, that certainly puts this population at risk for those dementia, or for that, the COVID-19 uh, risk factors. And it's estimated, we know that many people with dementia are not diagnosed. We all know that. But an estimated number of Americans living with the disease right now is at, is at 5.8 million Americans. Most people with dementia do develop it after the age of 65. By 2025, we expect that 5.8 million number to jump to over 7 million. And then without any developments in medical care, treatment, um, and certainly a um, way to prevent the disease, those numbers by mid-century will, will be inching up more toward the 14 million. So I just want to put these slides in here to just um, emphasize the need for this discussion today um, as it relates to individuals with dementia. Another interesting statistic is that almost a third of people with dementia actually live alone. 
and 50% of that group don't have an identifiable caregiver. So if you consider an individual becomes ill with COVID-19 um, and they have dementia and they're living alone and they don't have a caregiver, it just even magnifies um, the, the, the situation. Dementia is our most expensive disease in the United States and caregivers report, these are caregivers of individuals with dementia, those caregivers re report twice as much emotional, financial, and physical difficulty compared to caregivers of in individuals without dementia. So we know that COVID-19 has added to all of our stress levels, I think that's fair to say. Um, it's certainly taken a financial toll on a lot of families. And um, if they were already a caregiving family for someone with dementia, you can see the impact is even greater. In Ohio, we are one of the leaders, unfortunately, in dementia incidents, um, projected uh, to increase to 250,000 people in the next few years. Right now, we're at about 220,000 people. And again, these are estimates because of um, under diagnosis and maybe even perhaps under reporting. But you can see that in Ohio, we have over 600,000 unpaid caregivers. 70% of people with dementia live in their home. And so a lot of the care that's provided for individuals is by family members, friends, neighbors, those unpaid uh, caregivers. So we know there are standard, kind of standard early signs and symptoms of dementia. And again, this is to just kind of get us all on, this, all on the same page. Um, I do want to point out that the symptoms do vary because we, we all use this saying, if you've seen one person with dementia, you've seen one person with dementia. So the symptoms are going to vary according to the individual and the type of dementia that they have. So when you look at the next few slides, um, you'll see that um, these are just some basic sets of uh, signs and symptoms. I also want to point out that these are in no way diagnostic. These are warning signs. I want everybody to keep that in mind. As I go through the slides, you might be thinking, well, I know so-and-so that fits, that's checking off five of these 10. Well, a lot of these symptoms are due to anxiety, stress, um, the effects of medication, an infection. They can be due to thyroid or other metabolic disorders. So it's very important that individuals showing signs and symptoms get a thorough evaluation by their healthcare provider. Really can't overstate that um, enough. So the first warning sign is certainly memory, and we're talking about short-term memory. So recently learned information, um, folks that repeat questions or stories. The hippocampus in the brain with most dementias is affected early on, and that stores and processes our short-term memories. So um, an individual that has um, difficulty um, remembering, learning new information, it's probably the result of the changes in that particular area of the brain. So with COVID-19, the, the person with dementia might repeatedly ask, what's COVID-19? That's new information, that's a new term that perhaps they can't remember, or they might uh, not remember that their faith community is closed. So every week it's the same question, when are we going to church or when are we going to the synagogue, whatever it might be. Um, so caregivers might expect more frequent questions and um, just more questioning in general uh, from the individual with dementia. When you consider that all the new planning that we've had to put into our lives over the past couple months with just daily activities, I think we can understand that this is even more difficult for a person with dementia that has maybe difficulty keeping steps in order or difficulty remembering um, medical appoint appointments. And now they have to remember that no visitation is allowed in the nursing home and I can't go to see my neighbor, Joe. Um, it, it's a lot for, um, for folks with dementia to, to, to understand and to remember. I 
Uh, I'm a healthcare worker, so those of you that know sterile technique, it's coming in very handy these days. I can unpack the groceries in half the time that my husband can because I just rely on my sterile technique processes that I learned uh, in college years ago. But just learning new procedures is going to be more difficult for individuals uh, with dementia. So the third sign is completing those familiar tasks, as we've I kind of uh, pointed out that already. Um, we've added new steps to some of these household chores. We've even taken some steps away, reordered them, making it more difficult. Certainly confusion with the time or the place. Um, keeping track of the day, the week, uh, that is difficult for people with dementia. I think we can all relate. Doesn't the last two months seem more like two years to, to you? I, I think it does to me. Um, so that, that's another typical um, sign. Trouble understanding those visual images and spatial relationships. And as we look at this social distancing and staying six feet, ap six feet apart from people, um, that may indicate how an individual with dementia gets through their day. New problems with words and speaking and writing. And, and what I worry about is that individuals with dementia rely on a lot of nonverbal cueing. So now, um, you know, we have these um, projections that we might be wearing masks out in public for the next many months. And just how that mask can not only muffle your voice, change the sound of your voice, but it can also impede those important nonverbal cues that come from your mouth. And, and, and certainly you have your eyes that you can still speak with, um, but the personal protective equipment um, can really interfere um, with um, communication with that individual with dementia that relies on that nonverbal uh, communication. I look at the pictures, um, of folks that work in hospitals that are literally covered from head to toe in their PPE. And I think how frightening that must be for um, all patients in the hospital. Um, it's necessary, it's needed, I understand that. But if for the person with dementia, I think that would add an, a whole nother level of anxiety to, to not be able to see and feel that human touch without a glove on. Misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace the steps. And I want to point out for this warning sign, that's the key. Losing the ability to retrace steps. We all forget things from time to time, but this is what separates um, this symptom. Poor or decreased judgment. Um, just again, we've had to change uh, the way that we do things in our daily life. So Perhaps the individual that lives alone with dementia, are they going to be able to figure out how to access services uh, in non-routine ways? Um, so I think it's important that we help those individuals know that those services are still there. They're just gonna be delivered in different ways. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in coming up. Withdrawing from work or social activities is another early sign and symptom of dementia. Um, this is often not known by the general public, but this is um, uh, really an early sign. Uh, people dropping out of their card clubs or their um, book clubs or their study groups. Uh, they're just not able to keep up with the conversations and the materials like they once did. And then the last one is change in mood and personality. And I think certainly with uh, changes in routine that we've had to um, cope with over the last two months, um, anxiety and perhaps fear, those can all have an impact on the individual with dementia in terms of, of um, altering their mood, maybe exacerbating some symptoms of anxiety that, that uh, we're normally under check, but now we might see a little bit more of that in both the person with dementia and the care providers. So it certainly is a time of change for everyone, and this is real-time change, right? Um, things um, just 
just change almost um, minute by minute, it seems. So when we consider that um, people with dementia like routines, do better with routines, this, um, again, this topic is so important uh, in this time of great change for all of us. It, I think, has even a more significant um, impact on families living with dementia. What are some of those impacts? Well, we've got all these new rules, all these new ways of doing things that we have to remember and that we have to adapt to. We there; Those are the basic daily activities. It's in how we get our services. There's certainly a disruption of normal routines uh, for individuals who attended adult day centers that are not open anymore because of COVID. That's a big adjustment in their daily routine. Um, perhaps um, Joe went to coffee every morning with his buddies, and now that is not part of that individual with dementia's routine. Um, little things, big things, whatever it, the cause is, that change in routine is huge. We talked a little bit about how the PPE, the personal protective equipment, can interfere with, with vital communication. And we're being asked to reverse these lifelong habits of hugging, uh, going out to dinner, at least right now. Um, some people wonder if we'll ever shake hands again. And certainly those are lifelong habits that people um, remember and will, I think, automatically draw to if they can't remember these new guidelines. And then there's this overwhelming amount of news coverage um, and really thinking about how much news coverage, how much information can the person with dementia really um, handle, uh, caregivers as well. There have been changes in service and support delivery. And I think it's important for us to help our families know that these services necessarily haven't stopped altogether but the delivery mode has changed. So how we get our medical health care um, through telehealth, that certainly has been a huge change over the last couple months. So medical providers doing telehealth, um, mental health providers doing vital counseling um, over the phone or online, uh, support groups continue to meet virtually, education programs, um, faith communities are providing spiritual quick care through live streaming or phone calls. And I think we're all staying connected to our families in a different way through Zoom or through uh, FaceTiming. And then those basic needs of medication and food, uh, medical supplies, those are now being ac accessed mostly through uh, home delivery. So again, I think it's really important that we help our families know that they should check in with that provider or that business and see how those services are being offered. I think there's a tendency to think, well, if my senior center's doors are locked and closed, nobody's in there. Well, in my local senior center, nothing could be further from the truth. Those social workers are in there um, contacting families, providing those, those warm handoffs to other services taking care of people like they always did. Through all this, communication is just vital. Um, in looking at ways that we can support people with through their disrupted routines, um, communication is so vital. And I just want to read through some of these basic communication tips of a calm approach. We know that people with dementia might not understand the words we say, but they will always understand how we say it. Not arguing, not correcting. Uh, if you have to ask questions, limit the questions, limit the choices. So it's not overwhelming for the person. Minimizing distractions. If you're doing a Zoom call with the individual, um, Getting rid of the background noise, the extra distraction is so important. Just constantly reassuring the individual in this time of change uh, probably can't be overstated. 
person-centered care, trying to maintain the routine as much as possible, offering meaningful activities and conversations to that person. And then we have all these new opportunities for, for free tours. You can get into the museums all across the, the world and we can see, um, uh, we can go to theaters and we can go to zoos that we didn't have access to before. So keeping that in mind as uh, new opportunities for, for families. When we talk about virtual communication, I think there's some, some things we need to help families with. Do they have the right equipment? Do they have the right platform, internet access? Is there a person in the home, if this is new, new to them, is there a, a person in the home that can help with some of this technology? Um, I know with teleconference calls or with telehealth calls, um, having a, a third person in the room to help maneuver the camera on the iPhone uh, if the if the physician or the healthcare provider wants to check a body part, say the, the person's back, the patient's back, um, you'll need somebody skilled with using the camera on the iPhone in order to do that. What time, what, what's the best time of the day for this appointment? Typically it's gonna be early afternoon for most people with dementia. It's not gonna be five in the afternoon when there might be more uh, chance for, for difficulties with uh, interactions. And then just limiting the number of participants. Uh, you have a Zoom family call with 25 people, that's probably gonna be too overwhelming. If you go for an hour and a half with that Zoom call, that's probably gonna be too long. So keeping it short and sweet, limit the number of participants, and just making sure uh, the technology it will support uh, that interaction. For the caregiver, we want to rec recognize that now we have added and new uh, restrictions, uh, but these are temporary, hopefully shorter rather than longer, um, loss of control on things like visiting individuals in the nursing home. But yet we also realize how resilient caregivers are and that they're used to um, compensating and making adaptations uh, for things that they can't control. Uh, we want to recognize that respite options for the caregiver have changed when adult day centers aren't open, and perhaps home health care is a little bit more difficult to access in some areas. So we want to be able to help the caregiver come up with some creative ways to adjust for those um, regulations. This might be a time for caregivers to put into some place, to put into place some delegating some of those caregiver tasks that have needed to be delegated. And, and these are uh, near distance uh, caregivers as well as long distance caregivers. Everybody can be involved. Um, it's just making those, uh, just making that delegation. We want caregivers to pay attention to their own health care needs and to seek out health care um, just as they do for their, the, the person that they're taking care of. And to, to know that those vital support groups and education that's uh, happening all over the country by dementia organizations and other senior organizations are still out there. Those tried and true methods for caregivers, deep breathing, meditation, exercise, we can't forget those. Those, those are always always applicable. I just want to say a couple things about changes in behavior. When you think about the routine being disrupted for the person with dementia, when you think about added restrictions and new ways of doing things that we've all had to learn over the past couple months, you can see how some of these behaviors might actually increase or they might be new to people with dementia. And to be honest with you, if the person with dementia is around more, around the house more, that caregiver may pick up on things that they didn't see before. So I think this is probably the most important slide in all of these is really assessing that behavior and asking yourself, is this behavior really a problem? Is it hurting anyone? Is it bothering? And if so, who's, who is it bothering? Who is it a problem for? 
Is it a problem for the person with dementia or the caregiver? And helping the caregiver realize that some behaviors are just common. But you, again, you go back to that question, is this behavior really a problem? So the individual who's bored, needs something to do, shuffling the newspapers and the magazines all afternoon, is that a problem? Is it hurting anyone? It might be bothering the caregiver, sure. But when you really look at it, what is that behavior communicating? I'm bored. I'm looking for something to do. I'm usually at the day center and they have 10 different activities for me all day long. So helping that caregiver realize that, you know, what is a problem and, and what's really not. And then when you look at that source of, of the behavior, is it due to basic things like needing a snack, needing to use the bathroom? Is there pain? Is there infection? And we always start with the UTI, don't we? Always assessing for that. Are comorbid conditions now not as well controlled? Are the blood sugars more out of whack because the meal pattern may have changed for that individual? Is it due to the environment? Is the environment over or under stimulating? Is it due to the way communication is being handled in the home? Or just real ex, real, unrealistic expectations for that individual? Are they bored? Are there unmet needs? So I really like this slide also in, in, in looking at that behavior and trying to find the source of it. And again, just starting with the basics up here in the left-hand corner. Some interventions for the behaviors might, a lot of times, is just related to activity planning, engaging that individual in things around the house. And for some people, activities with repetitive motion seems to be comforting. Um, providing exercise and spiritual care. I know this sounds like a lot for the caregiver, and it is. And, but helping those families identify who else might be able to help in this time of limited socialization and uh, support by other people. And again, just looking at the environment, is there too much distraction? Do I have the news on 12 hours a day? Is that getting to be too much for the person? Um, is the lighting good enough? Uh, so just looking at the environment there. One of my last slides here is looking at the issue of what happens if the individual with dementia and or the primary caregiver or other caregivers get sick with any illness, but particularly for this discussion, COVID-19. So I think it's really important for, for caregivers to know what the symptoms are. And those are easily found on, on websites and on the news and so forth. Um, an updated list of emergency contacts, a 30-day supply of meds, uh, copies of advanced directives that are in the home and might be tucked away in a folder somewhere, get those, uh, have those accessible. Consider who's going to provide the day-to-day -day care if the primary caregiver can't. Where's that going to happen and how is that substitute going to know what to do? How are they going to learn the routine? Is telehealth uh, an option for this family? And if so, which providers offer telehealth services? So certainly early on in the illness, um, I think checking in with the primary care provider is important to know, uh, to kind of go to figure out what the next steps are here. And for folks that are considering a trip to the ER, considering perhaps this person with dementia needs to be hospitalized, trying to get a sense of how your local hospital is, um, what some of their uh, rules and regulations are. And the big one to me is, will that person with dementia be allowed a companion? I know in some hospitals early on they were not, and now some of those restrictions are loosening up. But just know about what, what do you want for this person with dementia in terms of palliative care or aggressive care? 
and considering what's going to happen if you don't want high levels of aggressive care in a hospital setting, uh, keeping in mind hospitals are for acute care. So being able to, to uh, communicate that with healthcare providers, and a lot of times that can be done through the uh, advanced directives if the family have those in place. My last slides are just resources, uh, both state of Ohio and national dementia resources that families can, um, and I've got some COVID ones in here too, the CDC, um, thought I had another one in there too. Um, but these are just good, re oh, there's Ohio Department of Health. These are good resources for families just to find out more information. The long-term care ombudsman might be a good source for some families who are having difficult navigating um, the care system at this time and uh, my reference page. So with that, I am going to um, just uh, turn it back to Nicole. Is that right? Yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Marty. That was a very good presentation and, and a lovely overview. Um, we have just a couple questions in the chat box and because there's a limited number, I'm gonna ask Emily Murphy, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, sure. So I was just wondering about any other recommendations um, on supporting uh, dementia patients in long-term care or um, memory care communities. Do you have any um, recommendations for that? Uh, it's interesting you ask that. That's a whole another three or four echoes in themselves, right? <laughs> so we, we really did this presentation as um, more of a general across care settings. Um, and so there are so many um, related to long-term care and they're changing again, almost hour by hour. Um, so I don't know if anyone else wants to take a stab at that or if that, or if there are, are, maybe there are plans for addressing that in another setting. Actually, I think through the, the uh, lecture tomorrow. Perhaps maybe even just a website or some kind of um, like point us in the right direction where, where we could find that or even begin to look. Yeah, I have noticed in the chat box there are a couple links to different resources um, to both the Memory Cafe directory and then uh, consumervoice.org. So the chat, keep in mind that the links in the chat boxes are not active, so you have to copy and paste them into your browser, but uh, definitely some good recommendations listed throughout the chat. What we'll do is following this presentation, we will make sure that we make uh, available the kind of listing that you're talking about, Emily. I think it would be very helpful. Thank you so much. And I, I know that the um, Ohio Department of Health has uh, guidelines across care settings. Um, that, that's one that I would certainly check out and then the CDC websites. But as Bonnie said, we'll, we'll put a more specific uh, list together for you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bonnie and Marty, for this presentation and putting together the list of resources. Um, Let me just, uh, if I could just add one more thing, um, ACL, uh, the uh, Administration for Community Living, they have um, some good re recommendations on their website as, um, as well. And that would be the National Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center, NADRC. Excellent. 